can't um, come. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm sad about it because I know she's overwhelmed, but she doesn't tell me why she's not coming either. I mean, that would really help. Um, I just don't know why she at least doesn't send an email. Because then I, okay, anyway, so, all right, let's see. So today, we're going to talk about the way the Greeks understood the human condition. But this isn't just the Greeks, it's the ancient cultures that are all based on wisdom as the goal of life. And so wisdom traditions are, are very different from modern traditions in how they understand the role of the arts. This is a major thing. <clears throat> but so you might, Collingwood might accuse uh, the Greek view of poetry and art as all a kind of magic. Um, because it is trying to teach you how to live. So, but it also taps into deep and powerful emotions. There's no question about that. Um, and that's because we still have this primitive part of our brain and it's intended to trigger that to make people aware that in a critical moment they might the veneer of civilization cracks. <laughs> That's what happens in, in Homer tragedies. There's a veneer where everybody looks like they're civilized and all that. And then all of a sudden, and then all the ugly stuff comes out. So there's a sense in which the poet isn't quite sure how the audience is going to take it um, because. By the time Plato's brothers were talking to Socrates, their elders were telling them that Homer waters these emotions and nurtures them. And Homer's message is, well, boys will be boys, you know, rape is rape. Um, rather than, no, you're going to want to do this. You're a powerful guy. Don't do it. Look at all the harm it does. Look at the harm to the women. Look at the harm to the children. And look at that, the harm to trying to have a decent civilization. So Zeus goes and rapes all these women and god goddesses and has all these dysfunctional kids. And then he tries to sit them around the table and tell them what to do so he can have a just city. And you know what? They don't pay any attention. Yeah. Like, why would they? Uh, <laughs> anyway, so you know, they're all cautionary tales. And someone like Collingwood might say, well, yeah, they're sort of um, pat characters. Whereas the answer to that is, well, there are types of people in types of situations. So if you make them, there's an existential side to it, right? It appears to be an actual historical event. But the reason it educates is because it taps into something that's deeper than that. Um, so this is where, again, you can juxtapose Collingwood with uh, the Greek view. Like, he wants deep and powerful emotions apart from any kind of natural structure, right? Um, he wants artists to be able to just sort of, you know, experience these things in a vacuum, right? To have transcended the spirit of their times and they're very aware of the corruption of consciousness and that's great. Um, it's just, where do these things come from and how do you know an artist when you see one? Whereas in the, you know, the Greek view, there's a source to the corruption of consciousness. <laughs> it has origin. Um, okay, so then you and um, you have Rollo May has, we have a natural drive for beauty, 
and his his thing that it's psychologically good for you it's an ecstatic experience it integrates your primary and secondary functions um and i would agree with that on the greeks but it's there they have a lot of stories about a lot of patterns so a very sophisticated view well it life. was virtue ethics goes along with the lack of a blank slate and that aligns with with um most of what we've read right it's like we're building towards this it kind is, of understanding that right. it's art a kind is of virtue inherent. it's a kind of virtue ethic but you can whenever i read the material for virtue ethics or business ethics it really trivializes virtue ethic and makes it look like a joke because yeah. it says oh the virtuous thing is whatever the person of practical wisdom decides well who gets to say does did it come across that way in your class yeah in in business ethics it definitely feels like there's this like happy medium that they're trying to reach and it seems like they really take the capitalist idea of well there must be an equilibrium between ethical and unethical and it's naturally going to fall that way when in a free market even the equilibrium isn't going to be met because that's not how capital works it's going to accumulate and then whoever's at the top collecting it is going to have the power to say whether it is or isn't ethical um i mean i saw a joke earlier where it's business owners are always complaining that whatever regulation is being started is going to end their business and they're always trying to push the line between what is completely unethical, which they would say is the regulation, and what is ethical, which they would say is providing the job. And that that is always going to change depending on what is the current situation. So that they're like, like business ethics and how I think virtue ethics is interpreted a lot. The medium is can be inherent, like I think Aristotle says, where it is different from person to person, but that every person has one. And it can be also diluted and kind of um, corrupted by, I don't want to say capitalism, but I mean corrupted by those in power. Greed. Greed. Yeah. Greed. You know? that, yeah. That's perfect. Because I mean, <laughs> oh, heck, was it wasn't greed. It was, I think that aligns most closely to like temperance, where right. you, you have to know what is and isn't enough. When in reality, usually enough is enough, and you don't really need to go past it. Yeah, actually, in our society, nobody can tell the difference between necessary and unnecessary desires. Yeah. Or, you know, freedom means you don't distinguish. And that, that destroyed Athens, too, the same thing. But if you think about Aristotle's virtues, self-control was and courage, but then the third one was generosity. And that one, he said, the ones to make you a good citizen are self-control and generosity, because you, you actually do depend on other people. And then being generous just is your way of living out that recognition of that dependence. And also it, it helps build trust and goodwill among citizens. And if citizens don't trust each other and don't have goodwill, i.e. polarization, then he says you don't have a polis at all. All you have is a set of rules designed to prevent wicked people from harming each other. And that's yeah. not a political community. Political community is learning how to think like a citizen and learning how to care about the city's future the stability yep. of the city, care about that your uh, what kind of world you pass on to your grandchildren, you know, all this stuff. But what I was getting at was um, Aristotle does revert to saying the person of practical wisdom is the one who engages in the art of deliberation. So the way that works is that the goal of all statecraft and all citizen consciousness is to promote everyone's flourishing, right? Yeah. And your individual and group and the future of the city is not at all split. Yeah. It's not 
self-regarding versus other regarding, not at all. Like, how can you practice temperance except in relation to other people? How can you practice courage except in relation to other people? I mean, the original desire, pleasure and um, fear is your own, but it always, you know, manifests in some sort of relationship. Like you, there's no such thing as rugged individualism. So um, anyway, so you don't divide the, the good of an individual and the community and the future of the society. But, but okay, so in deliberation, that's always the goal. And so the person of practical wisdom knows when there is a critical moment, a decision has to be made. And why it's really critical, it's going to have these ramifications into the future. It's not trivial at all. Um, and then which options are actual, which choices are actual true options? So you're not good at deliberation if every time you decide, you say, well, what, what will bring world peace? <laughs> Because, you know, that's not an attainable goal, right, for a choice. Yeah. So on the other hand, so you can have options that are way too idealistic, and you can have ones that are way too pessimistic. Mm -hmm. Like, all anybody cares about is money, so let's just go for it, you know? Because yeah. that will self-destruct. So deliberating you you can lay out the options and they really are options they're all very feasible and they will all have different consequences and then you can uh decide which is best and you can reason about it right you can anticipate consequences you can anticipate long-term effects all of it is related to flourishing you're trying to maximize that then you decide which one is best and why. You can explain why. You know why. You don't just go, ah, well, it's intuitively obvious, blah, blah. You have to give an argument. And then you're also good at persuading other people who need to, to be on board, persuading them to make the choices collectively and also to um, accept that these are the best consequences. These are reasonable consequences and they're the best possible consequences. All of those together are practical wisdom. And that's difficult, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you do need to have the intellectual virtues, the information necessary to, to consider what the options are. Sometimes that's science. Sometimes it's social science. Sometimes it's, it's actually the kind of pattern recognition that you're supposed to learn in the humanities. But the humanities doesn't teach it anymore because they don't really believe in the mind anymore. Yeah, it is separated into psychology and that's not so much of a social science anymore. Well, that's what happened was this belief that knowledge in the in 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 the Apollonian sense, the god Apollo, god of reason, yeah. you can construct a whole society on Apollonian reasoning. And <laughs> Apollo is immature and he's indifferent to justice. I mean, people knew a long time ago that this was not going well. But my main point though is that in order to refine your, your practical wisdom in order to actually be able to make a decision, the whole poetic tradition is educating you, educating your emotions and educating your reasoning capacities and trying to educate your intuition, your idea of the good and your desire so that when there is a critical moment that all that stuff will kick in and you'll be able to deliberate well. But you really need to have, you know, you need to attend a lot of tragedies, listen to Homer, but dances, music, history, um, 
comedy, every, all this stuff. And then it's not just the Greek stuff, like stuff from other wisdom. There's nothing uniquely Greek about this, right? There's great Hindu mythological tradition and, um, and the stories of Buddha, the stories of Jesus are all myths, right? These characters yeah. have been mythologized. They've been, the stories are, some of them are historical. And then the scholars get all, uh, you know, hot and bothered about, well, what did he really say versus what are we not quite sure he said? It's just, I mean, ancient traditions, they don't give a hoot about whether it's a fact because a scribe can write down facts. They wrote stories that said, this is the kind of person and this is the kind of thing they would do in this kind of situation. And that's why, and there's stories that we can identify with. And so they're showing us, well, Confucius handled it well, here's how you could handle that or Jesus or Socrates or whatever. So, um, so they're trying to train, educate your intuition. And that's what the arts are trying to do. And, in order to do that, you have to know yourself. You have to know all the emotions that you have, the whole range that you, some of that is, you know, for good or evil, so that you do develop empathy with other people. Like, even if I don't really want to stab my husband to death, after I see that tragedy, I can understand why Clyde Mester is so PO'd. Yeah. And yeah, okay. So it isn't really actually physically killing. It's you kill the marriage, right? You kill the relationship. Um and and that in turn affects your children and it affects the culture because you're raising a bunch of dysfunctional kids. <laughs> yeah. Right? Okay. Um well, but let's go back to the to the um mean uh let's go back to all of these and just go through them so you remember the aristotle's virtues and i'll just whip through them um my main point here is that it's a biological model of human flourishing virtue is simply what enables the human organism us as rational animals to function well, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to have integrity. We want to integrate emotions, thoughts, actions, and a way of life. And if you don't really want to do what's virtuous because it's virtuous, you'll never have integrity. You'll always be conflicted in some way. So we want to aim for this integrity. So personal is relation to these pleasures we share with the animals. Courage is in relation to fear. And animals also, you know, obviously have a lot of behaviors that are responses to fear yeah. driven by survival. But humans have this additional stuff that they fear death, which most animals don't fear because they don't you know, they don't know what's coming. They, they don't fantasize about the future. You know, they don't have phobias or fantasies about the future. Yeah. And that is partly because they don't have language because they can't create a future in any long-term way. They can have memories, but um, it takes language to actually structure all this stuff. Yeah. Um, some of it true and a lot of it false, right? <laughs> We're much more likely to create false fantasies and phobias. Um, but but yeah. human beings fear, they are driven a lot by fear of failure, fear of loss of status, fear of rejection by your friends, right? Ostracism. And that's partly because we depend on social acceptance to survive, but it's partly just because people need status, right? They need respect. Um, 
a lot of things that go beyond just physical survival. Generosity, um, we have to do that, as I said. Magnanimity is when people like Bill Gates give away a lot of money, right? Yeah. Um, even temperedness. Um, if you don't, have you ever uh, been angry at someone and never expressed it? Uh, yeah, I okay. can definitely say yes. Yeah, I would think so. Introverts tend to be like that. But the trouble with it is that you don't forget, right? And yeah. it's, it's you hold a grudge, or even if you don't hold a grudge, you still don't forget. Whereas yeah. people who just get mad and move on, they don't even remember. <laughs> I, would, I would say that this is where different, different, I'd say different art. What was the, not magic, but amusement can come in because it is technically an outlet for the motion that it creates and that's the anger. But then there's also the um, other outlets. So like I have wrestling, it's a very physical yes. sport. And also theater, which is an art form to to take out and express those angry emotions or the sad emotions, so that like that is another use of art that I'm bringing up. I forgot why I started to bring it up, but there are other ways to go about doing that, which I think sets sets my um, golden mean probably lower then it could be, or higher. I can't remember which, which way is higher and lower. Higher. Higher, yeah. Yeah, um, well, yeah, theater is definitely, even participation <clears throat> in the theater yeah. helps. Um, also, you see, you watch, you get to know other types of characters. And if you want to be a good citizen, you do need to know what people are like. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think the real education comes after everybody watches the performance and then they go to the Daverna and they talk about it, right? Yeah. So like you could have a play about Agamemnon and he's being his regular SOB. He's so full of himself, but you go to the Taverna and somebody says, I love Agamemnon, he's just great. And you know, you go, what? He's, he's a dictator, like he's anti-democratic. How can you like him? But yeah, then, you then you understand, okay, we have a society that's democratic, quote unquote, but the souls of a lot of people are not. Yeah. So how are we gonna govern this society, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to just keep talking to people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, obviously with even temperedness, I asked the students once, how many of you think that when somebody violates your rights, you have a right to fight back, but you give that over to a standing body of laws? Because otherwise, if everybody thought their everybody overestimates their own case, they would just start, you know, they would overreact, and then the next person would overreact, and you just have social chaos. So that's why you need to give it over to yeah. the standing body of laws. And I, you know, in Minnesota, I used to ask that question, and I don't know, four fifths or five sixths would raise their hand. That made sense. Then they go to Arkansas. <laughs> oh my God. How many of you think you really need to give over that, you know, revenge to a standing body of laws? And like, maybe one fifth of them is their hands on go, right? Yeah. That's, that's vigilante it's, justice. Yeah, I, I think that brings up a really funny, um, what's the word, like kind of kind of paradox where at different, it's the same thing with like certain aspects of gun rights where both, both ends don't really trust authority. It's just what they don't trust authority with and it, it, it's, it's, they both see a problem, but neither of them can agree on what exactly the problem is. Or how to, yeah. yeah just or how, how to, to solve it. it. Well, how to solve it is just to blow up the system, right? Yeah. 
the trouble is when you do that, it's always the lower three fourths that suffer. Yeah. The top one fourth never suffers. They find a way to take advantage of that to centralize their power yeah. because everybody else eventually has to get back to work and mm -hmm. has to kowtow to somebody or they're going to starve. So it's the richest ones that can live, you know, hold off, how hold out in a chaotic time. Yeah. So trying to get at the privilege by declaring a civil war or creating chaos is, is just, it's sad because there's no way that's going to happen. Yeah. They're going to be worse off. But anyway, so we have issues about anger and January 6th and all this stuff that Americans really don't agree to the rule of law. So they're not really Democrats. Yep. Anyway, so then, then there's a rational ambition, trying to find out what you can do well and doing it for the sake of the people who need it, whatever it is, there's a job in. It exists because somebody needs or wants what it is, the skill set yeah. that gives you that career. So you should always use it for the well-being of the people who need it. But you can always, you know, put money first or power first. But yeah. that destabilizes the society because it makes people less um, secure, like you sell them crappy goods. And they spend money on something that doesn't work or, the, you know, and so they become less stable and their household income, you know, gets undermined. Um, rational pride is honoring people who go beyond what the society asks. So when you have an honor day, every institution has honor day, right? You honor people that went beyond what the contract required. And yep. you really need to do that. People do, shouldn't just be doing their job and going home and, you know, hanging out with their family. You really need to contribute to the quality of life. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> friendships uh, inspire each other. You imitate each other. You encourage each other. That's really important. Or you deliberate together, right, about an issue. You just talk about human affairs um, informally. And that's really part of the education of your mind. Um, sociability, putting up. This, again, is becoming a big problem in our society, right? People won't put up with little things. And that yeah. just destroys everything. Um, truthfulness, knowing yourself and not trying not overestimating yourself then you have all sorts of incompetent people making decisions that everyone suffers from um but then you tend to have people that are oppressed like minorities women who, yeah. that underestimate themselves right because they've been beaten down and they get mansplained you know and they let that bother them. Uh, then the political virtues are the ones that come from making a profit, the economic sector, the art of legislation, making laws or creating institutions, policies that promote overall uh, large and stable middle class and allow, encourage, inspire everyone to flourish distributing wealth and wealth includes not just money but education healthcare um, how to allocate resources how to provide opportunities for people who have the ability and the motivation um, and then you know and each one is different like nobody should give me a five-year all expenses paid program and a phd in math like what a waste of money, yeah. <laughs> right? Or sometimes, you know, community colleges, you get, if you get free community college, well, some kids don't want to go to community college or they want to go to technical school. I mean, 
We yeah. really need to figure out what each person, and they have to help, they have to encourage, you have to tell you too, what do you want to study? Have you taken tests to show that you have the natural ability? Do you have motivation? Then you provide the opportunity, right? There has to be some accountability on the part of the person getting the money, but yeah. everyone should, if they have motivation and ability, have it. Then how to wreck. So these are different. People are unequal in the kind of opportunities that they should get. But the rectification of wrongs is where everybody should be equal. So it shouldn't be the case that if you're rich enough, you can hire a lawyer that's been proven to be really good at get, getting people off and then costs a lot of money. So only the rich get the good lawyers and yeah. they always get good lawyers and everybody else gets nothing. Um, so, right, that's, that's an injustice and we know it's an injustice. Although there are plenty of capitalism loving people who don't even blink at that. I've had students say, so what? It's like, really? What if some rich person murdered your sister? Are you gonna say, yeah, really good lawyer there, got her up, got him off. Like, I don't understand. These kids defend capitalism without even thinking about what it actually means. Like they don't really think about context. Yeah. And I guess, Liam, that's what this whole education of the muses is that you think about a lot of contexts other than your own, right? You have yeah. a free imagination and you think of contexts that you haven't yet experienced, but you could experience in that or other people have. I mean, you can't deliberate about anything unless you have a pretty wide ranging imagination. Anyway, so equity is applying the laws to particular cases. Yeah. And then practical wisdom is knowing how to um, go through that process of deliberation. Um, justice is choosing what's best, knowing the situation, doing it for its own sake, no ulterior motives, and then having a strong character. Um, all right. So the muses all focus on the realm of reality that isn't natural necessity. It's not impossible. It's this realm of contingency, which really human beings, because of their power of choice, literally create a history, but they don't create human nature. They create what they do with it and uh, how they develop their culture and um, their history. All right, so a uh, just person has integrity, fate, um, some things are fate in the sense that this is the human condition. Um, some things, and the way I define destiny is that that's each person has a different mix of these things and they have to deal with particular issues. I mean, the issues themselves like greed, everybody deals with, but the particular way that each person deals with it at various times, they have a little whole life history of how they actually deal with it, right? So the goal of these stories or these songs or these dances is to have a higher level of self-conscious awareness. So you're aware of your capacity for these things. And then you're aware of more about the people around you. Um, know what you know and don't know. I think that's probably enough. Oh, and the other intellectual capacities, these are the ones that you associate with reason, coming to college, um, science, math, technical skills, um, calculation, calculating the appropriate means to whatever goals you have, and cleverness, knowing how to be able to get what you want quickly. <laughs> um, all right. 
Oh, did you? That's. Oh, there another theme that comes up in these texts is the rule of one person, a monarch. Sometimes the monarch rules for the sake of the ruled, and he she's just. Sometimes for the sake of the ruler, and then she's unjust. The rule of the few. If they really are the rule of the best, if they really do have practical wisdom, then it's just and the society is just, but it tends to revert into the rule of the rich because people who are aristocrats because they earned it, they have children and they don't want to admit, well, your child is really a natural ditch digger <laughs> or your child is really not someone you would want to trust power with because they're out of control or they're greedy or power hungry. You know, you don't yeah. inherit this. You don't inherit virtue. It's not a genetic thing. It's yeah. all a matter of effort. It's, it comes about through choice and effort. Um, so democracy is not necessarily the most just society. The rule of law, constitutional government, when the citizens are virtuous, it's just. And when they're not, it's unjust. Um, and actually, Aristotle's view of the most, uh, the best society is what he calls a polity. It's not a democracy, it's a polity, which is a combination of uh, elected officials and appointed officials which is what we have in this country, right? We, yeah. have, we elect people, but then the president appoints the heads of the cabinet and the cabinet members have a lot of power. And I wish that's what I vote on the basis of, who is this president gonna put in those cabinet positions? The head of the Department of Defense, the Environmental Protection Agency. That to me, that's the criteria. And, Nobody, none of my students, it hasn't occurred to any of them. And yeah. that's scary, right? It's scary. Yeah. Um, all right. So if that's true, then here's the next one. That um, these, these patterns are the same deep down, right? Even though they get lived out in particular existential situations. So the myths uh, explain patterns. Um, history, Herodotus concentrated on events, Thucydides concentrated on patterns. And he's trying to tell a history that tells how Athens lost its democracy because he knows this is going to occur again. So yeah. please avoid this mistake. So that's where history becomes a muse. Um, Plato's dialogues, he's a poet. And he explains yeah. also how, okay. And this is where Collingwood might say, well, that's magic, right? That's not art. Um, whereas Plato and Aristotle, if it gets from the particular to the universal and if it resonates and people are educated because they can make analogies, oh, that's him or, oh, that's me. That's what the poet does. And so that's, that's how they would distinguish art from non-art mm -hmm. is if it gets down to the collective unconscious and if it tries to, to um, motivate people to live more flourishing lives, right? So there is a standard of human flourishing. There's assumptions about basic human nature. So, I mean, it is within parameters and um you know it's up to you if you want to call it and if Collingwood remember when Collingwood talks about Plato was so afraid the arts had turned into amusement yeah yeah and so definitely when Homer is read as if he's feeding these irrational desires instead of trying to get them to flush out you got problems um and that's kind of like Leon when people use biblical quotes to justify every vice in the book, right? Yeah. Then like, what are you gonna do? Like the medicine is making you sick. 
you'd be better off not even taking it. Like, don't even read the Bible if you're going to just look for stuff to justify your vices. Yeah. If you, you know, if you just act viciously for a while without quoting the Bible, it might occur to you that this is not very virtuous. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's only if you can hide behind a Bible quote that you get away with it. Um, so human beings are born psychologically blind. We're distorted. Our thoughts, our characters are formed by people who themselves are out of balance, right? Or if they, if they aren't perfect, then a kid is going to get messed up, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because they depend on it so much. We're vulnerable, yeah. we're prone to delusions. But that's why I like teaching college, because I think that's the point where you can stand back and start thinking. Like you, you don't have to go home and sleep like high school. You don't, you know, you're not thrown back into all those habits. Um, but you then, you really need to rethink everything. Um, yes. So goal is wisdom. And what what is the goal of tragedy? It, provides a controlled environment. People observe people like them. They observe the um, veneer of civilization breaking open in this controlled environment, right? Not waiting for everything to fall apart in, a, in the public square where it gets plain old dangerous. Um, so you have it in this controlled environment and then you can actually learn and prevent those mistakes. Um, bring about a heightened level of self-conscious awareness of yourself and the people around you. It's a kind of medicine. Um, you're transformed from ignorance to wisdom. Um, you also stop thinking that just because you had good intentions that that's good enough. You know, everybody has good opinions. It's the choices that they make that determine whether they're happy or whatever. Um, the other thing about it is that, yeah, people make terrible mistakes and they have five really good reasons. So you have to really learn that reasons are not good enough and you can really deceive yourself. You can, you know, create all these wonderful arguments and convince yourself you're right especially if you're smart, you're even yeah. better at it. Is that, does that make sense to you, Liam? Yeah. Okay. Um, the history wrote, um, as it, Sophocles, there was a, a definite moral order behind things. And then gradually the um, characters start being more and more cynical um, and also relativist. But the way I read the tragedies that I studied is that the poets' arguments and what they're trying to flush out never is always the same, but the kinds of characters and the way the characters interpret the gods becomes more and more degenerate. And, and um, they use the gods to justify their own behavior or they just think it's all relative. Um, and so that shows, but the poet is just showing, you know, that the culture is corrupt. We don't even believe in these messages anymore. Yeah. Um, and they have characters that are relativists because they want to speak to the audiences, right? Yeah. This kind of relativism isn't going anywhere. It's a disaster. Um, all right. So then Aris, Plato was concerned with magic. Um, and Aristotle, did you say that? I thought it was Plato, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, they're both worried about both. Um, does that make sense to you? Yeah, that, that, um, that they're concerned about the act or every act that art can have. It's not just about the amusement. It's not just about the magic. It's, it's about everything. Um, yeah, but if people reduce these tragedies to amusement, right, you're in trouble. Yeah, especially when you think about the whole point of them going and discussing afterwards. It doesn't, right. it's not just about 
one aspect. It's not just about calling them to look at their democracy. It's not just about calling them to look at these characters. It's about making them think of the characters and the context that build towards how the characters got to their positions. Right. So you can avoid getting people into these situations in yeah. the first place. And then once you're in it, you can avoid overreacting. Yeah. Um, okay, so does, is this a theory of psycho art according to Collingwood, right? That it's concerned more with the effect than with the expression of an emotion? Um, or could it be the same as what Collingwood talks about as collaboration? like the artist wants to um, communicate what they see because, you know, because it's inside of them. And then, you know, that's something to think about because um, again, Collingwood has given up any collective unconscious. So, so, you know, you can't have a formula. The artist just sort of tries to be sensitive uh, false consciousness, like what is false consciousness? What is authentic? Somebody can be really authentic and really have an unhealthy emotion. Uh, or people can start disagreeing on what's healthy and what's unhealthy and all that sort of stuff. So he does sort of assume a basic understanding of what is corrupt about the West and how to get back to some yeah. more. Yeah, so anyway, you can think about that. Um, and then do you remember, oh, art getting associated with class. So the rich have the leisure time to go to these events. Um, but the thing about the tragedies is interesting is you have these slaves and the, you know, the one that I studied was Hecuba. There were slaves on each side, the Achaeans and the Trojans. And the slaves had more empathy and more humanity than any of those damn aristocrats, okay? Yeah. The slave really felt bad. The, um, the Greek slave really felt bad for Hecuba because his people killed her daughter, you know? And he felt yeah. terrible for her, but she couldn't care less. You know, she she uses her handmaidens to go kill the king Nestor. So it ruins their life for good. They're a bunch of murderers. And, um, and then Nestor's whole city, everybody in his city is, you know, has got, not got a future. She doesn't care at all. And so it is interesting, obviously, and that's why it's there. Like the aristocrats have no empathy and the slaves have a lot of empathy. And then yeah. the middle class people. So it really has this whole range and you're supposed to see with your mind how we're all in this together, right? Yeah. And so it isn't supposed to be just rich people sort of studying the classics and feeling superior like Berger said, right? Or even mm -hmm. Collingwood, it can get turned into this way for rich people to believe that they're more civilized and to sort of sell that to the public um, mm -hmm. and maintain their power and privilege. Um, anyway, all right, heightened self-awareness. The heightened self-awareness is definitely there. Uh, the artist needs to have a healthy soul before they can create anything yeah. uh, worthwhile. The question is, you know, is there a structure in a healthy soul or not? There's a degree of individuality in Collingwood. That's not so much in Aristotle. He has a more essentialist framework. Um, a good artist has to be wise. Does that make sense to you, Leon? Yeah. Okay, and this is definitely not what you learn at all about virtue when you study virtue ethics, right? And yeah, this is like, an expansion in a different direction, for sure. Well, it's a lot more profound. And mm -hmm. so they really do take that out of context and make it look silly, I think. Um, 
I, there was a standard ethics book by Mr. Frankena who describes these different schools. And he starts out with, and actually in the introduction, he says, first of all, like the first paragraph, virtue does not mean performing its function well, like a knife that can cut well. And I was like, that's what Aristotle think it is. I'm sorry, like the first paragraph, he wipes it out. And then he has a chapter on virtue ethics. It's like, oh God, it's pretty annoying, right? Yeah. Okay. A burger appears, do you remember? Because he is really into if economics, if the economic system changed, things would be entirely different. Well, yeah. that has to be a blank slate, right? Um, if capitalism hadn't just gotten stuck in publicity, we'd all be happy or something. Um, whereas again, the Greeks think we have these primitive emotions and capitalism, communism, whatever is not going to prevent that. You have to educate yourself. Yeah. Um, then the nothing but our freedom, that's, it's not, you know, this view is not based on that. Um, all right. It's not either freedom or determinism. It's just not a modern point of view. And that's a false dilemma. Okay, um, there were the 11 points and that's just the plot is what matters because that's people's choices. People are yeah. happy or unhappy based on choices, the characters. Mm -hmm. um, you know this, right? If you're in uh, theater. Um, kind of. I practice theater, like I am in the practice of theater, but a lot of the theory of it goes over my head because I'm not a theater major and I have never taken a theater class. I just act. Okay. Well, there's intermediate it appeals to people who aren't particularly good or particularly bad, which are yeah. audiences, right? And mm -hmm. then it shows it's trying to educate you know, people who are intermediates to try and become uh, more savvy, more virtuous, but also more uh, aware of how virtue and vice play themselves out in human affairs. Um, let's see, pity and fear, all that stuff. Um, pity and fear, the word pity means um, pathos and phobos. So pathos is pathological. That's mm -hmm. passive emotions. You're reacting. And then you're, you're, so you have to identify. It's also identifying with this person in a pathetic state. Yeah. And then being afraid of your own capacity to do that. And then, you know, flushing that up, saying, okay, I'm glad I got educated. It's like an inoculation. You get this vaccination so that when it actually happens, you might avoid the mistake. Yeah. All right. So did you read the section on uh, Socrates and Oedipus? On, I read, oh, geez, let me see it. Yes. Yes, I did. Okay. So it, it explains that, that Oedipus is a hero because he has this quest for the truth, no matter how painful it is. Yeah, um, and then it's it, and then it relates to Socrates and the whole inward search of knowledge with the um, Oracle of Delphi and the whole you know being put to death because he is the most wise. And <laughs> yeah. Well, what do they show? They both show the radical insecurity, right? Mm -hmm. He thought he was a good leader. Um, yeah. I mean, really, that play is amazing. He gets. You know, he's trying to find the cause of the um, plague because he's a good leader. He came and he saved the city. The city had just lost its king. And he agreed to marry the queen and have children. And they look at him as savior. And he thinks he is. I mean, why wouldn't he think so? And then he says, I'm willing to do anything. I mean, even if the killer lives in my very house, like, 
I will do what it takes. Like it's so ironic. <laughs> but yeah. I think what this is, is I know people who are driven by the Oedipus complex. Oh my God. When I started dating people in midlife, oh my God. Every, almost every one of them said, well, I am not my father's like, good, I'm glad, but who are you? Like, so to what extent are men driven by their competition against their father for their mother's affection? It's just scary, Leo. Yeah. Do you, I mean, at your age, I never would have had any clue about this stuff, but do you understand that? Yeah, I, yeah, I think for a lot of younger, not just younger guys, but a lot of more like emotionally immature guys, it is, a lot of it is, or a lot of their insecurities and things come from either a place of trying to identify with or identify against their, their father, which can either be yeah. their authority figure or one of their, their like archetypes, one of the models that they live to. And at, in the beginning, it is, it is in for competition with the mother or for the mother and then later in life because the mother isn't around anymore they start to just apply the same sort of not archetypes the same actions to everything else and it they becomes a really dangerous that. yeah it becomes a really dangerous sort of like fault and set of faults that they fall into yeah it's what it, what it is is a complex so it's an obsession <laughs> Yeah. So you can't, it doesn't have any um, limit. So mm -hmm. if, a, if a mom thinks her husband doesn't make enough money, well, obviously that's, you know what he's going to want to do. You're just setting a kid up yeah. to be greedy. But if he doesn't consciously know that's it, he could think of himself as, well, I'm really a good guy. I'm successful. I'm doing what societies always want people to do, right? Mm -hmm. And my mom, you know, my parents are proud of me or my mother is or whatever, but they're not aware that this desire to please or compete is making them terrible leaders because they'll do anything just to get richer and they'll call it success because your mother calls it success or something. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah. Anyway, so the radical insecurity, they, that's really important. The Athenians never thought they'd lose their democracy and Oedipus never would have thought things would come out the way they did. Um, blindness, people are blind to the people they identify with, to the people they love. Um, even what the wisest and most intelligent do that, right? Yeah. You're so you're so in love with your love of your spouse that you have no idea what kind of person they actually are. <laughs> Is that you, you notice that? Or yeah. you're so in love with your love of your children that you don't notice that actually that kid isn't really a very good kid. And you don't yeah. discipline them. Yeah, okay. The curse of honesty, Oedipus is honest. He, you know, he relentlessly keeps going, even when it's starting to look bad. And Jocasta says, no, don't go any further. You know, you don't want to know. And he just keeps going. And that's why he's a hero. Like he's going, and in therapy, this is the people who really benefit are the ones who decide they want to know no matter how painful it is. Everything they thought was good about themselves, they might decide is not at all. And yeah. that's painful. But if you can do it, then you stop repeating the patterns. Um, now, this is where I disagree. Um, it's not inevitable, right? So, there's a lot of scholars of tragedy that say it's inevitable. Well, the whole point of having a tragedy is to prevent people from doing that, right? Is to educate the public so it's not inevitable. It just requires education. Um, we can't benefit all, all right. 
but we can recognize. So somebody, once they recognize that the Oedipus complex is playing on them and they can check themselves, right? And they can avoid making at least the biggest mistakes. But yeah. that's the whole point of having these, the poets writing these stories. And then we have to re-examine our notion of justice and injustice, partly because especially we never know the characters of people outside of really close family members as deeply as these plays. And so we have to figure that, okay, other families are plagued. So there's the family of Laius is plagued by the Oedipus complex and it lasts for three generations. And yeah. then the house of Atreus is plagued by sibling rivalry complex. And um, the house of, well, the house of Laertes is actually the, the, a healthy house. And the father was just and the son and then the grandson. So yeah. they give you these patterns. Really, I think they're really helpful. Um, anyway, all right. So there's a serious action and all those. And then I write about Plato's dialogues as tragedies and Socrates um, has all those character traits. So did you have any comments or questions about that? Um, no, not that, none that I wrote down. Okay. What about the um, review of the movie? This one, you didn't have to look at. Um, it was a, it was interesting because you did, do you know Oedipus at Colonus? Do you know the second play? No. And, um, well, anyway, I... that's fine. It's after he's old and his sons come to him, he's blind and they mm -hmm. wanna ask for his blessing or something. All of a sudden he can see through the characters of everybody, including his kids. So he's blind, but he can see, right? Um, anyway, they did a one with African-Americans and it was so good because um, anyway, it just plays on that whole history of slavery. And there's yep. Athena, um, and Margaret Thatcher was a classic Athena. She was very heartless. She defended the patriarchy. There's a lot of them now, a lot of women now. Yeah, that do that. Margaret Thatcher um, is a not so beloved historical figure for a reason. Yeah, no, she was just a, a butt kicker. Her, her father was a, a shopkeeper, which is why the Republicans took such advantage of her because she was this yeah. lower middle, middle, lower middle class, hardworking, you know, just like the Trumpies. Mm -hmm. uh, just work hard, pull yourself up. You know, you don't need social programs, blah, blah. Yeah. She, it's just like, she doesn't have a lot of mercy. Um, yeah. Okay, then this one is the actually a Methodist. So, hey, Liam, did you think about the Methodist church liturgy? Um, no. Okay. I don't think so. Okay, so when you go to church next time, it starts out with an idea of the good, right? Yeah. Um, made in the image of God or love God, love your neighbor, like you have this image of what you want. You want flourishing. And then you have singing, so you use the arts. Mm -hmm. And churches, you know, that's where the artists flourished for centuries until the modern era. Then you confess. So then you go back into the dark side, right? Which was a tragedy does. And then you, um, you pray about it, right? That, yeah, I make a lot of mistakes and I make, I do this and that and I, and then you get assured, right? You're forgiven. Yeah. And that's, there's a catharsis, right? The kind of purgation. Mm -hmm. that you have to admit you have all this crap. And then, um, and then there's, you know, this cleansing and there's more music. And then there's, uh, then there's lessons like uh, stories, the epistle yep. lesson, the scripture lesson, these are stories or histories, but the histories have a pattern. And then the sermon is supposed to interpret 
what those excerpts mean and how yeah. they represent patterns and how they apply to current events. Well, that's exactly what you're supposed to do when you go to a tragedy, right? You're mm -hmm. supposed to think about, well, how does it apply to now? Um, and then um, you actually you go back to your idea of the good, you know, you envision a better life and then you move on. So, yeah. um, so in a, in a lot of ways, this is magic, like Collingwood said. Yeah. But it's also a psychological cleansing. Um, it sort of integrates the secondary and the primary processes, like um, May said. Yeah. Um, this one is okay. Here's about Schmidt. Did you read this? Um, hold on. Sorry, I'm gonna pull it up because I heard. You say that. Okay, I know. I I read it last night. Yeah. Because I remember the reading it, the Tenenbaums part. <laughs> what did you think of the review? Um, hey, sorry, I'm pulling it up. Because there was a specific part that I do remember, and it was like halfway through. Jeez, why is it hard to find? <laughs> it really was an amazing movie. Um, his relation to his wife. You know, the, so he's retired and they're having these couple over their friends and she's, you know, this happens, you know, your spouse is always talking about the same things or complaining, you know, and you're just kind of yeah. patient. And then she ends up dying and then he's just totally at loose ends. He doesn't know what to do. <laughs> um, then all of a sudden he's radically insecure, right? His, his job as an insurance salesman has just sort of, you know, disappeared and his marriage has disappeared. And, uh, it's, it's disheveled. He doesn't know how to take care of himself. This happens to a lot of guys. Actually, a lot of them even die after their wives die because they just can't take it. Yeah, they die um, of heartbreak and stress. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so um then he he realizes what he loved he goes on this journey it's it's so incredible really and um warren and his daughter his daughter is about to marry this water bed salesman and he meets his uh his son-in-law's parents and that doesn't go over very well and, he just thinks she's marrying beneath him and all this stuff. <laughs> it, um, so, oh, yeah, I think he, I think I remember. I I wrote down a specific part where I basically just talked about the movie Up, and like, in in the Pixar movie Up, it's after um, I forget the main character's name. After Ellie, Carl's, Carl, that's his name. After Carl's wife dies, he is left alone. And then he's like, you know what? I'm going to go finally finish this trip that we saved up our entire lives for, but never got to do. And it becomes a, a journey of self-discovery because they, him and his wife could never have kids. And then eventually he gets a surrogate son through this Boy Scout that kind of got stuck on his porch when they flew off, which sounds really weird if you don't know the context of the film. Um, and I compared, I just thought about the journey that um, Nicholson's character went through as Up because yeah. I'd seen Up a lot more. No, it's a standard, you know, yeah. ordinary people is um, American beauty. It's all about, you know, that house in the burbs with mm -hmm. the cars and the dog and the fence that people fantasize about so much, it's not so good, right? Yeah. And kind that's really important. What? It's kind of depressing. Well, but you do need to stop fantasizing, stop ignoring all the other problems so you can just make enough money to get to the burbs and get away from it all and be happy. Yeah. It's, just, it's constantly trying to warn you against that. Um, and the, the time that really hit home was, um, when they were interviewing women in the burbs, women in the burbs are 
big targets now for elections because they can turn elections. And so you're out in Atlanta and you have these African-American, you know, one in five or something in the burbs because they finally worked their way out of the ghetto and out of the first rung suburbs and into something where the house is going to increase in value, yeah. you know. Well, then they're sitting around and they they tell the interviewer who they voted for. And all of a sudden, this African-American woman realizes her neighbor is going to vote for Trump. You know, there's racism in this place. Like, it's not what it looks like. Yeah. And God, but that's the kind of thing. Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, what are her options? I mean, you're not going to raise your kid somewhere where they get in with the wrong crowd or they get this association that black people don't achieve as much. I mean, I know in the Twin Cities, there was not a good choice for African-Americans. If they stay in the city, then there's a disproportionate number of poor underachieving blacks. But if they move to the suburbs, it's only 5% minority. And then you just have to be wannabe white or some damn thing. And the people are also racist. So some of them are. So it's just, it's a bad situation. But um, anyway, uh, about Schmidt, he goes to his own, his old fraternity. And of course, all the, none of the kids care. But, he, yeah. you know, just, all right, like, life has passed him by all these years. Mm -hmm. And then um, the thing that bugged me is there was a review about this movie. And it had nothing to do with the message of the movie. And yeah. it was all about Jack Nicholson and what a great actor he was. It was just awful. And they interviewed Jack Nicholson said, I've, I'm nothing at all like that guy. You know, I needed another one, a new woman to sleep with every night. It's like, he's nothing at all. He's just a really good actor. And so the whole message just disappeared. Um, yeah. But it's also like, what is that play by Arthur Miller where, I don't know, there's, there's always tragedies about people trying to achieve the American dream and it, it just blows up. But anyway, so let's see, then Amazing Grace. So that's kind of it, Liam. Um, do you have questions or comments? Oh God, I had one, I had one. And it was one that I didn't write down. Oh God. Um, oh, I have another one that I didn't kind of write down. Let me finish reading it so I can summarize. Um, so, so building on what we've had, art can be used. We know that art can be used to kind of diagnose a society. And depending on whether it is going to be the, what the artist sees or just as a representation of society um it the the way that it's going to diagnose truly is through not is through being connected to its means of, of production right like um i got i gotta bring up dewey again because he's my closest point of reference and the one i know best that it, it has to be close to how it to who made it and the circumstances from which they lived so anything from the museum conception to the high society pieces of, of art won't work. But that leads to an interesting point with the Greek, with the Greek plays, because they, um, as far as I'm aware, they didn't cost anything to watch, so long as there was space for you to watch them, right? Oh, yeah, and there's a place for the slaves to stand, and there's a place, and also you're required to come in everything shuts down they have these religious festivals you're supposed to go and then you vote like they had this contest and the citizens vote and so the founding fathers right the people who run the society are telling you we want you to pay attention to this we want you to learn these lessons it's part of your uh, responsibility as a citizen and then you go down to the taverna and talk about how you're going to vote and what you think and blah, blah. It's just really this effort to develop citizen consciousness in the public, kind of public education. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Um, and then that, 
that brings up another aspect of we know that reviewers lose their actual ability to review so long as it is it is for a job or so long as it is for critiquing for critiquing sake so long as it is not actually somebody like actually looking at the piece and then thinking of those things on a whim it is it is corrupted right yeah because they what they say or not has so much power and they won't if they criticize too much probably lose their job um and if they are enablers and say everybody's wonderful they'll probably be hired or promoted and if the public doesn't even know the difference between education and amusement, of course, they're not held to any sort of meaningful standard then. Does that make sense? So, yes. So that creates a really unique space in the modern era where we have this massive amount of communication and this massive amount of potential for the production of art. So let's say um, uh, all of the artists on like Bandcamp where it's not Spotify, where you're not gonna get shown if you aren't the most popular. Bandcamp is literally like when you upload something, it goes in, in this like list of newer things and that's separated by genre and all that stuff. So the incentive to be seen is only to get on like one specific spot. That's like the, the, the hot stuff that isn't even the first thing you see when you open up the website or the app. And, that, and this applies to like podcast and public broadcasting channels. So, and what I'm trying to get at is that it creates a really unique space where there is a, a more free place that you can have your ideas and your art shown without the corruption of greed. And I, my, my question coming to that is that even if the, let's say a society like, like our society is starting to fall towards the failures of our historical or failures of historical precedent set. There is always the potential to be redeemed if if we can cure the ails. And as long as it's diagnosed and people can see the diagnosis, there is still the chance of redemption, right? Right. And you can always yeah. create that app, right? So creating the app yeah. right, is itself a creative act and it's part mm -hmm. of creating community and it's part of doing something honorable. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and I do think creating community is a creative act. Um, in a lot of ways, like the tragedies themselves might be works of art, but they, they don't want you to focus on, you know, the work of the work they want you to focus on the message so that you make different choices right yeah so it is that effort to bring society to a higher level of consciousness and civilization right yeah. so all the artists really want to move the culture upward <laughs> forward um let's see what else was I going to say? So we had, so that starts out with something like Rollo May with archetypes, but it goes way farther. Um, and then you can compare with Collingwood or Berger, like Berger's is pretty limited. It's just about visual painting. Yeah. Whereas again, tragedy, even sculpture is all about a way of life, mm -hmm. right? So every one of those sculptures of a god or a human being the people know the way of life behind it it's not yeah. just about itself it's it's um, capturing a moment in a, like a full action like um the not the statue of david i actually went no no no, no just, anyway it's one of the it's one of the ones where it's david versus goliath but it's just david and he's in the middle of prepping to yeah that's it goliath Leonardo. Yeah, it's that one snapshot in the full story. Yes, I actually saw that in Florence. Really? Um, cool. Did you know that it had, it was a piece of marble with a big crack in it. 
And so that's how Michelangelo, you know, that's why he's got his legs apart and all that. That was where the crack was. Um, but yeah, it is really seeing, I don't know, there's no replacement to me for to seeing it, the originals. Yeah. Um, because they can trigger your imagination much better. And I think when all you see is virtual stuff, you don't even think that what it means to appreciate art is to be able to have the work trigger and expand your imagination. Instead, yeah. it's just like you react and you can have any reaction you want. Mm -hmm. um, now, Berger, what would Berger say, right? He would say it's okay because then you demystify the past and you take the class privilege out of it, right? It's, yeah, right? I mean, if you think only people who have seen the originals and who can really, you know, have enough training to be able to imagine the artist creating it, whereas the low life people that just look at virtual, they don't have expanded consciousness. Well, okay, so Berger says that's bullshit. Uh, you can Xerox off anything, create your own history. Well, yeah, but that's freedom, right? That's this, everybody's free, but we still have these deep and powerful emotions and just to pretend we don't is not gonna prepare us for life very well. Yeah. Um, so right, right there between Berger and everything else, it, it, what was I gonna say? Oh God, I had a thing, I had a thing that I forgot. Oh, oh, the separation of, of, art from class and the place of the internet and mass media um separating art from class is important because then everyone can experience it and it can give everyone a greater ability to understand the circumstances of others but this brings up a specific thing that i think is very important um like public broadcasting is trying to separate um media from let's say those that can afford cable but then it still takes the barriers to entry and i think most art is going to have that issue so long as it is not um what's the word publicly accessible and through the internet it it theoretically is but then you do still lose the um uh you still do lose the ability to have that greater um prompting of the imagination, which then puts it behind the, this actual barrier of class. For to see it, yes, that is for everyone, but to experience it is still out of reach. That's the difference between, that's Dewey, right? To have an experience. Yeah. yeah. And to I, be able to, to create something out of that experience. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, Let's see. There's something else I was going to say, but that's okay. It slipped my mind. Um, well, is that enough? Will that do for you for today? Oh, yeah, I, then... I think we're. Sorry, what were you going to say? Actually, we've gone more than an hour and 15 minutes, right? But for uh, next was... time, for next time we read about... Plato's Ion. Okay. So, and it is about, I mean, I, I guess I don't want to even spill the beans. No um, spoilers. Yeah, I want to see what you think of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was going to say about actually the context where everybody comes in from the rural city states and comes and watches these tragedies, that is more accessible to the whole public than what we have now, right? Yeah. Plus, the plays always include the slave class, the middle class, and the aristocratic class. Mm -hmm. And you're always exposing them, right? So yeah. socially, the middle class and under, maybe middle class especially, only see the aristocrats in their very formalized appearances. But in a tragedy, you see that these people sometimes are real jerks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know why so many people think Trump is a good guy. Like, how can they think that? 
but I, I yeah, don't understand I, it, it at all. It's kind of, it's just a strong man. He, they tout him and the propaganda is that he is strong. So people believe that he is strong. It doesn't occur to them that he's, he's, uh, you know, he's uh, exploited people like them his whole life. Yeah. And that he was, he did not work for what he has. He was given quite a bit of it and just kind of coasted. Well, no, he didn't. He, he, he tanked it. I mean, he's a lousy businessman. He was yeah. given $420 million by his dad. And he went bankrupt like two or three times. He's just yeah. a really crappy businessman. Yeah. If he had just invested that money and done nothing, he, he would have come out better. 50 times, well, 50 times richer. He'd be huge. Yeah. Anyway, um, I there's something wrong. People watch all of these TV shows and movies, but somehow they don't understand character. I don't. I don't get it. Like, I just don't get it. I've been fooled before, but, you know, I, with age, it helps. Um, but that was like the Athenian Athens wanted people to really start understanding, seeing through the false appearance of aristocrats, having mercy on slaves, don't treat them like dirt. They're not. They have a heart. Uh, and middle class people sometimes are good, sometimes are bad, sometimes they make the decisions, sometimes they don't. Um, anyway, so get an idea in your head, right, of the human condition, how complex it is. Yeah. And just figure the more you learn about that, the better off you are. Yep. And okay, well, I will see you. Is it how many hours till we meet again? 22 um, yeah, ish. Okay. No, wait. it's going to be right. like around 2021. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to make sure that I got everything, all my ducks in a, in a row here. All right. So, Ivy, if you listen to this, um, please contact me. If you see her, it just seems like. Yeah. If I see her around campus. Her. Yeah. I'm pretty worried about her, so. Okay, um, I'll have to stop the recording and we'll see you tomorrow. And it's not much of a reading, yep. so that's lucky.